Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. In our last video, I decided to clarify some of the issues related to energy partition in the Sun. Now I wish to turn my attention to nuclear reactions and stars. In this video, I presented the HR diagram. According to modern theory, stars change their position on the diagram as a direct consequence of aging and changing their nuclear fuel source. For instance, in a star like the Sun, modern theory holds that only helium synthesis from hydrogen dominates. Once hydrogen is exhausted, astronomers argue that stars leave the main sequence and become red giants or supergiants. Their internal temperature goes up and they now begin to use the triple alpha reaction and other more complex processes. The key point is that all motion in the diagram is absolutely linked to changes in nuclear reaction. Why is this? It is because in the standard model there is nothing else that can be controlled. Gaseous stars have no lattice, so everything hinges on changes in nuclear fuel. This is all outlined in advanced text and based on this classic paper. On the one hand, astronomers believe that they fully understand all the nuclear reactions inside stars. Yet they have crippled our own sun. They forbid it from synthesizing any elements heavier than helium. Yet, a wide complement of elements have been detected in the Sun as we saw in this video. So how do the astronomers deal with that fact? They simply invent another star which preceded our Sun. That first generation star made the heavier elements and the Big Bang helped make the lighter ones. Our Sun simply absorbed those pre-made materials. Talk about placing a patch on a theory. Now you have to ask yourself, why was it that the patch was even required? The answer comes from the fact that the astronomers believe that the internal temperature of the Sun is too low to synthesize the heavier elements. Of course, they were never able to measure those temperatures. They simply calculated them using outdated and thermodynamically questionable models. The same astronomers neglected the tremendous energy contained in the convection currents of the Sun as we learned in this video. Since they do not believe that the Sun has a lattice, they also ignore all the advantages of this lattice in positioning nuclei for reactions and in transferring energy into a set of nuclei. Hampered by their ideas, they have no choice but to cripple the Sun and invent first generation stars. Therefore, I restate that the Sun can make all of the elements. There is tremendous kinetic energy in the convection currents of the Sun. It is reasonable to postulate that this energy can be harnessed to make the elements. It is unreasonable for the astronomers to limit the ability of our Sun to make the heavier elements when we have been able to accomplish the feat with relative simplicity on the Earth. Currently, it is advanced that the PP reaction and the CNO cycle are the only significant reactions that exist in the Sun. Here is a view of branch 1 of the PP reaction. That branch is thought to exist in the Sun. The first step of this reaction involves the combination of two protons to make a deuterium atom, but the cross-section of this reaction has never been measured on Earth. This series of reactions is thought to exist in stars with core temperatures of 10 to 14 million Kelvin. Stars with higher core temperatures are said to be able to include branch 2, 3 and 4 of the PP chain, depending on their temperatures. The fourth branch is theoretical and has never been observed. Yet it is reasonable to assume that branch 1 of the PP reaction does exist in the Sun and the others might exist as well. In fact, I would not limit the ability of our Sun to engage in any reasonable set of nuclear reactions leading up to the synthesis of the naturally occurring elements. However, I question the validity of the CNO cycle. It is said that the cycle was first advanced by two scientists in 1937 and 1939. The problem with the CNO cycle is that it is cyclic in nature and this poses tremendous hurdles. Cyclic processes depend on the careful adjustment of each reactant and this is not probable in a star. Let us turn to the well-known TCA cycle in biochemistry to help us understand why. 
The CNO cycle of the astronomers was proposed almost concurrently with the discovery of the TCA cycle in biochemistry by Hans Krebs in the 1930s. Since cyclic processes had been essentially simultaneously discovered in stars and in the cell, there must have been a certain amount of great enthusiasm about these cycles in nature. But after the TCA cycle was discovered, the complexity of that cycle became more and more apparent. There were important controls placed on many of the reaction rates in the cycle. In addition, reactions could be made to use only a portion of the cycle and mechanisms were discovered which tightly regulated each of the metabolic intermediates. Eventually, it became clear that the TCA cycle was permitted to exist because of such tight controls over rates of reactions and levels of intermediates. The cyclic process could only exist in a highly regulated environment. But in a star, such regulation cannot exist. A star is not a living system and cannot ensure that a component of the CNO cycle will even be present to enable the continuing functioning of the process. Furthermore, like the TCA cycle, a portion of the CNO cycle could function without the need for a complete cycle. Other reactions might come into play in the sun. In fact, it is interesting that there was no evidence at all for the CNO cycle in the sun until this past year. That is when astronomers began to argue that they have confirmed the presence of the cycle through the detection of neutrinos. But if one carefully studies the papers, it becomes apparent that the astronomers are just trying to extract data from noise and interfering signals. Here is just one quote from one of their papers. In this work, the three CNO neutrino components, figure one, were treated as a single contribution by fixing the ratio between them according to the standard solar model prediction. Several backgrounds contribute to the same energy interval with a rate comparable to or larger than the signal. An elaborate multivariate fit needed to disentangle all of the contribution follows a procedure similar to that adopted in 6, 15, and 20 and described in the appendix. Their claims are little more than wishful thinking, coupled with a good dose of public press. They have interfering signals larger than the signal predicted by the standard solar model. Then they have to apply complex multivariate fits in order to extract the desired data. Worse still is that they cannot be certain that neutrinos that they detected have anything to do with the CNO cycle. They could have been formed by other nuclear reactions in the sun. This takes us finally to the solar neutrino problem as an example of scientific overreaching. The solar neutrino problem centered around the fact that insufficient levels of neutrinos were detected on Earth relative to what was predicted in the standard solar model, as highlighted initially by John Bacall. In fact, only about one-third of the expected amount of neutrinos were detected. This was a potential blow to the standard solar model and highlighted that something was seriously wrong. So how did the astronomers solve the problem? Rather than state that their model was faulty, they simply changed the physics of the neutrinos. They did it by invoking elaborate data processing methods and statistical analysis to extract something from overlying noise. In order to save the standard solar model, they had to insist that the nature of the emitted neutrinos themselves changed on their way to the Earth. Physics had become so confident in their models that now nature itself had to be changed in order to allow the models to survive. The reality is that the solar neutrino experiments were not definitive for the standard solar model. Therefore, it might make more sense to look for an alternative rather than try to hold on to a gaseous model of the Sun. Perhaps as solar physicists acknowledge the energy trapped in convection currents on the Sun, they might actually make some progress towards a more lucid understanding of the universe around us. We might actually get rid of the need for first generation stars and permit all the stars to make all the elements. That would be a great step forward relative to clarification of astrophysics. Scientists have a choice. They can accept that the Sun has energy in its convection currents which can drive nuclear reactions. 
or they can continue to deny that this energy exists and rely on the existence of first generation stars instead. The choice seems to be clear. Finally, there is an alternative to explaining the presence of stars at different locations in the HR diagram, and that involves the realization that stars can have differing lattice structures. We will return to this in the future, but if you are interested, I have already touched on the subject in these two presentations. Well, that is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the video to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.